Good morning, Yellow Box. How's everybody doing? All right, I am not Ian Simpkins. I, I, I was told I should come with a cardigan sweater. <laughs> w- would you have thought that I was Ian if that was the case? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're one church, multiple locations. As Patrick said, I spend most of my time in Plainfield. Pa- uh, and I should say that Ian, who is your primary teaching pastor, community pastor, he's on vacation. Anybody know where he is? Grand Canyon. Today in the Grand Canyon, it's going to be 108 degrees. <laughs> wow, doesn't it feel better in here? Anybody who was complaining that it was cold? Not anymore. Well, hey, let's get started. I want to start talking about kids. And you don't have to have kids to relate to this because we are all kids. And every kid goes through a phase. Lots of different phases. For example, one of those phases uh, that these young kids go through is the no phase. Everything's no. I have three teenage boys now. My wife used to give me a hard time because I'd like to exasperate them. Uh, what my kids used to, what I used to do to my kids, I'd say to them, you know, stop doing that. No. Go to your room. No. Throw that in the garbage. No. Do you want ice cream? No. Got ya. And she's like, stop that. They don't really get that. I'm like, no, he said he didn't want ice cream. Uh, but then there's the mind stage. Everything is mine, mine, mine. Even if it's yours or yours, it's all mine. And then there's the I only want my mommy stage. You know what this one's like? My youngest, he's 13 now, but anytime my wife Amy would go away for a few days, he would mope around the house. He'd be like, where's mom? When's mom coming home? Where's mom? And here I am, like I'm changing his diaper, I'm wiping his butt, I'm feeding him, I'm reading him stories, and I'm like, really? You're going to say that? Dads, can you relate? I mean, come on, that's just not right. But they all go through it. And then they have the the do-it-myself phase. Anybody in the do-it-myself phase right now? You have kids. They want to prove to you, they want to prove to themselves that they can do it all by themselves. So they want to dress themselves. Now that's kind of harmless, it's kind of cute, it doesn't match, but we laugh. Uh, One that's a little bit more complicated is they want to feed themselves. Ugh! When my kids were little and they wanted to feed themselves, I had to put a drop cloth, you know, all around their chairs so that we could just fold it up and throw it in the washer afterwards. Uh, And then girls in particular, they want to put makeup on all by themselves. (laughs) Yeah, I hope that's a washable Crayola marker that mom gave them. But here's the thing about these phases. I don't think we ever really grow out of them. I don't think we do. And in particular, the do-it-myself phase. For example, and see if you can relate. Uh, We want to make it vocationally all by myself. Uh, I want to make it financially all by myself. And this is something very uniquely uh, familiar in the United States of America. We celebrate stories. We congratulate stories. You know, this underdog who, you know, pulls themselves up by their own bootstraps all by themselves. We're like, that is so awesome. But I came across an article. This was from a French philosopher, uh, Alexi Tocqueville. And he came to America to observe our culture, you and me. And he described us with, as this rugged individualism. And what he actually says, and I'm going to read it, is, is really kind of like a gut punch. At least it was for me. He says, each of them, withdrawn into himself, is almost unaware of the fate of the rest. Mankind for him consists of his children and his personal friends. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, they're near enough, but he does not notice them. He touches them but feels nothing. He exists in and for himself. I won't ask for a show of hands, but might that be true of the majority of us? It certainly was for me. And that brings us back to the series that we're in, Bumper Sticker Theology. This series was born out of the realization that much of what is commonly thought to be good theology, things we say, things we repeat, is actually not based on the Bible. It's just not biblical. Sometimes it's actually just based on on popular sort of thinking. These are our colloquialisms. These are these cute, clever sayings that we put on an adhesive piece of paper on the back of an automobile bumper sticker. And so every week in this series, four weeks in total, we're asking ourselves, these things we say, these things we hear, we're saying, is it biblically sound 
or does it just sound biblical? Is it biblically sound, or does it just sound biblical? And today's bumper sticker, I think, is a good one, and here it is. God helps those who help themselves. I know you've said it. I know you've thought it. I know it's been said to you. And and here's the reality. The majority of people in the United States of America believe this statement, this sentiment, God helps those who help themselves. We believe it to be biblical. And I know we believe it to be biblical because of a Barna research study that was done where they found that seven out of 10 people think that this quote right here is actually from the Bible. Seven out of 10. 60%, 68% of all Christ followers in the United States of America thinks that that is the word of God. 75% of all Americans believe this. And since we believe it's in the Bible, we say it. We say, God helps those who help themselves. But why do we want to say it? I mean, why do we really want to say it? Uh, regardless of whether it was biblical or, or not biblical, why do we want to say it? Why do we continually repeat this? I, I think there's a number of things. Uh, our teaching team, including Ian, we got together and, and we thought of three things, three reasons that you know, we might be inclined to say this. And sometimes I think we say it because we, we, we forget. We mistakenly think that we ourselves have made it all by ourselves, financially, vocationally, educationally, and because we mistakenly think that we have done it all by ourselves, we look around at people that seem to be struggling and, and we think, we might not say it out loud, but we think to ourselves, oh, well, if they just do what I did, then they'd figure it out. After all, God helps those who help themselves. Look at me. And so we say it. I think other times we say it as a way of feeling like we don't have to be responsible for other people in need. We look around. And, and we, we, we clearly see that there are people that are in need, and, and we walk through life. And, you know, we want to be able to just kind of put blinders up. That's what we want to do. And we say to ourselves, I don't need to help, because God helps those who help themselves. Chances are we've all thought it. And occasionally we say God helps those who help themselves, really kind of out of str- a frustration for people that we think are lazy, or maybe who are taking advantage of the system. So those are some reasons that that we say it. Now, you all know that the point of this series is is to debunk this, that it's not biblical, that it's not the word of God. But if it's not the word of God, then, then where did this sentiment, where did this phrase, where did this saying ever really come from? So our team, we did some research, we went on to Google, that's a good place to start, and uh, we discovered that something very, very familiar showed up in print in the year 500 BC. How many of you remember Aesop Fables? Aesop Fables, yeah, I had a book as a kid, Aesop Fables. I used to read them at night, my parents used to read them to me. Well, there's one Aesop Fable in particular where a character prays to the Greek god Hercules, he doesn't exist by the way, and he prays for help, and Hercules responds to this character in the story with a charge to get to work because, and then he says, the gods help them that help themselves. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? And that was 2,500 years ago. But how did this sentiment make its way into the United States of America? Well, maybe you're familiar with the name Benjamin Franklin. Anybody, give me a nod. Yeah, Uh, 300 years ago, in in a book he wrote, Poor Richard's Almanac, he said it. And he said, God helps those who help themselves. So I know it's hard to believe, But for 2,500 years and 300 years in the United States of America, we have said this, we have thought this, and we actually believe it to be true. Now, that might explain, you know, why this is in the American psyche, the American consciousness, but why do so many Christians, remember, 68%, why do so many Christians think that this is, in fact, the Word of God? Well, if you were here last week, you know that Sherry Benke was the teaching pastor, and she, when she was debunking last week's, you know, God won't give you more than you can handle, you know, our team, we searched the Bible on that one as well, and it came back to something that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church 2,000 years ago that has been misinterpreted and maybe through a combination of the telephone game has been distorted and repeated incorrectly, and I think the same is true for God helps those who help themselves. 
So our team, uh, we scoured the Bible, and the only thing that we could come up with that was even remotely familiar was this one here. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, and he said, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now, it's not exactly God helps those who help themselves, but that's as close as we could get. But still, that's not really what it means, and we need to understand the context of what Paul was saying here. So back in the day, if you were part of that early church, these communities would get together, and, and they would have sort of like a, a pool of money that they would all contribute to. And it would be used for the benefit of the community or for anybody who had a need that was significant. You know, call it the, the kitty, the pot, the, the benevolence fund in the middle. And that's what it would be used for. But apparently there were a few people in the town of Thessalonica who were capable of working but refused to work. And instead, they were sort of dipping in to that fund of money. And so among other things that Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, he's calling this group of people out. Now, he's not saying that everybody has got to go out there and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. He's not saying that. But what he is saying is he's setting up a healthy set of boundaries. And he's saying, no, we ought to be a community who, who, who rallies around people who are unable to help themselves. That's a good thing. But, but at the same time, that he's saying that it cannot be an excuse for not working. If you don't work when you are mentally and physically capable of it, no food for you. That's what he's saying. No food for you. Does that make sense? That's the context. So it really isn't God helps those who help themselves. It's similar, but it means something very different. <clears throat> so if the Bible doesn't say God helps those who help themselves, and God's mandate all throughout Scripture isn't a, a self-help theology, then, then what does the Bible say about who God helps or, or how God helps? Well, there's probably lots of places we can turn to in the Bible, but I think the place that we need to really look to is the Old Testament for starters. And if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Proverbs chapter 31, but I'll put the verse of Scripture on the screen as well. But let me just give you a backdrop, an overview of Proverbs. Uh, there are many Proverbs, and the idea of a proverb, these are wise sayings, and so they're Holy Spirit-inspired uh, and the author is, is writing these down. They're, they're instructions for how we ought to live. But Proverbs 31 is just a little bit different because the author of Proverbs 31 is, is recounting, is writing some sage, wise advice that he got from his mother who got from the Holy Spirit. And so if you'll allow me, all right, maybe this will just help us remember it. It's kind of like a Forrest Gump thing. And so he begins like, you know, my mama always told me kind of a thing. And maybe that'll help us remember it. So if you'll allow me to paraphrase, Proverbs 31 begins with, my mama always said, good leaders don't chase after women. My mama always told me that good leaders don't drink too much. My mama always told me that good leaders don't numb their feelings. I mean, I think that's good advice, but then it gets really, really good and really personal in verses 8 and 9. Again, Holy Spirit inspired, the author of Proverbs 31 has this to say to you and to me. He says, make sure, make sure you speak out on behalf of those who have no voice and defend all those who have been passed over. Make sure to open your mouth, to judge fairly, and to stand up for the rights of the afflicted and the poor. Now, think about that. There are lots of places in the Bible where we're told to be still and to be quiet and to keep our mouths closed. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, we practiced memorizing scripture. And do you remember that? My dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. But this is different, isn't it? In two verses, Holy Spirit inspired, we're told that we're to speak out and we're to talk, but, but why? Do you see why we're supposed to and, and when we're supposed to? It's for those who don't have a voice. And it's for those who can't speak for themselves. And then we are to come to their rescue. And we're to come alongside them. And, and that reminds me of a speaker here that we had at Community on this stage, I believe, a few years back, uh, who had directed an amazing documentary titled Among the Discarded. Maybe you remember this. But this individual, he spent um, a month 30 days he spent on Skid Row in, in a homeless community in, in, the, in the community of Los Angeles, California. 
And he said it was, it was one of the most fascinating but, but horrific things. In this film, he recounted that surprisingly, the most difficult thing to endure was the psychological effect of people walking by without acknowledgement, without even acknowledging. My hunch is that when we all walked in the lobby today, we, we, you know, we said, hey, good morning, hey, how are you? Or we at least you know, did one of those, hey, how are you? See you up there, yep, I acknowledge you. But what do we do when we see somebody who's homeless? I'm not gonna single anybody out. We're probably all guilty of it at one point or another. But you know, you see somebody homeless here and you're walking along. I think the majority of us have a tendency to kind of go like this. I don't really want to acknowledge you. And the author is saying that for 30 days, within the first few days only, that was devastatingly impactful to his self-esteem that nobody would acknowledge him. So, not only is the saying, God helps those who help themselves, not true, but I believe God is asking each and every one of us to speak up and to speak out and to open our mouths and to stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. The voiceless, the passed over, the poor, the oppressed, the homeless. And why? Because God loves all people equally. As much as he loves you, he loves people in these conditions. And I think it's also important for us to note that God is calling us to judge fairly. That's what we read in Proverbs 31. We're to judge fairly. And that means that we're supposed to look beyond what we can just see at face value. We've got to be intentional. We've got to work hard at looking beyond that. When we see somebody struggling in poverty or experiencing homelessness, judging fairly means that we don't just see them as the sum total of their poor choices or their mistakes or their failures, but we work to understand the influences that are completely beyond their control that are contributing to their present day set of circumstances. And to demonstrate this, uh, what I'm saying here, let me just share an illustration, and this comes from a guy named Malcolm Gladwell in a book that he wrote called Outliers. Uh, Are you guys familiar with Outliers? I think it's now part of high school curriculum in the state of Illinois. I know it is in the Plainfield School District where I live, and both my boys who are in high school have read this. Fascinating. He tells a number of stories that have one thing in common. And the one thing that these stories have in common is that advantage, the advantages that you and I have in life are accumulated. That's what he's talking about. And, and, and specifically, he says, those who are successful, in other words, are most likely to be given the kinds of special opportunities that lead to further success. Think about that. One of my favorite examples, and maybe this will help clarify what we're talking about, in his book is from a study about how somebody becomes an all-star hockey player in the country of Canada. Now, I think most of us would think that if I'm going to be an all-star hockey player in any country for that matter, uh, it's going to be, you know, I've got this raw talent, uh, I'm going to practice a lot, I'm going to hit the ice early and late, and I'm going to have good coaching, and I'm sure all of those are important variables and and influences on whether I'm going to be an all-star pro or not. But what he discovered in his research is that of any elite hockey team in the country of Canada, 40% of all the players were born in January, February, or March. 40%. 30% of all the players were born between April and June, and only 20% were born between July and September, and then 10% were born between October and December. Now, you have to ask yourself, why? Why are 40% of the all-star hockey players born in the first three months of the year? Well, Gladwell explains. He says the explanation for this is quite simple. It has nothing to do with astrology. That's good because we don't buy into that. Nor is there anything magical about the first three months of the year. It's simply that in Canada, the eligibility cutoff for age class hockey is January 1. A boy who turns 10 on January 2nd could then be playing alongside someone who doesn't turn 10 until the end of the year, like December 31st. And he goes on to say, and at that age, in pre-adolescence, a 12-month age gap or gap in age represents an enormous difference in physical maturity. So just think about that, right? Now, for, for really nothing that they've done on their own, they, they just, because of when they were born, they have this advantage. 
Now, that may seem like, you know, just sort of a, a silly example for us that, you know, someone just born in the first three months can be an all-star hockey player, and that's more likely than if you were born in the last three months. Um, but, but how much more might, might other um, outliers uh, speak to us today? And, and, and this is what the whole book is all about. It's not just about hockey and, and what makes a person a, a, a professional athlete or not. For example, how much more might mental illness or socioeconomic background or race increase or decrease what Gladwell calls the special opportunities that lead to further success? Well, let me give you a few to think about and ponder. And, and maybe these uh, will be as convicting to you as they were for me. Did you know that 25%, 25% of the homeless population suffers from severe mental illness? Do you think that would have a factor in why they're homeless? How about this? Did you know that uh, of every person who is incarcerated, a men in particular in the state of Illinois, that 60% of them grew up in the foster care system? That's staggering. And would you view those who are in prostitution differently if you knew that 80% of people who participate in prostitution were sexually assaulted as children? It's staggering. You have to look beyond just what we can see at face value. And that's what it means to judge fairly. As we judge fairly, as we read in Proverbs 31, we recognize that there are factors simply beyond pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps that influence outcomes both positively and negatively. Judging fairly means we, we recognize that we didn't do it on our own and neither did anyone else. So if you'll allow me, I'd love to flip the script this morning. And here's a true saying. This is the one we tweet. This is the one we post on social media. And here it is. God helps those who can't, cannot help themselves. God helps those who cannot help themselves. And do you know how I know that statement's true? Because when I was helpless and could do nothing, God rescued me. And when you were helpless and you could do nothing to reconcile your relationship with God, he reconciled and rescued you. And, and I love the way the Apostle John states this so beautifully in his first letter. He says, this is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. You see, God helped me when I couldn't help myself. And God helped you when you couldn't help yourself. And because God helped us, John goes on to say, this is why, this is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and you have the means to do something about it but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? John says it disappears. And you made it disappear. And my dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. Now that can be a bit convicting, so let me just sort of clarify what I don't think this means. I don't think this means if, if we fail to help somebody when we have the ability to help, that God's love is gonna disappear from this world. And I also don't think it means that if there is an occasion where you or I fail to help somebody, that homeless person or that person in distress, you know, we just sort of, that God doesn't love us. I don't believe that to be true. But here's what I think John's saying. What I think he's saying is that if we are able and we don't allow God to use us to help those in need, then the evidence of God's love in our life will disappear. You see, so often God helps those who can't help themselves. And you know how he does it, primarily speaking? Through people like you and through people like me. More often than not, he uses other people to help those that are in need. So what does practicing real love look like? Well, I, I imagine there's, there's many expressions of that, and we could have a, a great conversation about that. Uh, but one in particular that I think is just a clear example here at Community is, is something called Kids Hope Mentoring that, uh, that is run through Community 412. And we've organized this in East Aurora and East Joliet and now in the city of Chicago. And I want to introduce by video Tom Ryan, and here's his story of what it means to be this Kids Hope Mentor. My name is Tom Ryan. I've been attending Community Christian Church for six years, and I've been a Kids Hope mentor for two. 
I was struggling with the idea of mentoring because it meant that you were just you were just focusing on one person instead of many. And then I heard someone talking about mentoring and they said, don't worry about the big picture, just focus on one person. And this is the way Kids Hope Mentoring works. It's really just a, it's, it's an undivided attention on one kid for one hour for every week for the school year. My very first day I was a little nervous about meeting him at the classroom door because I hadn't seen him and he hadn't seen me ran over, gave me a big hug the first time he saw me. Um, at the end of that hour together, um, he said he can't wait to tell his mom about me. And I was only there for one day. Our typical activities will include just about everything that's kind of fun as far as we build models, we uh, color posters, and we build buildings, we make things out of paper. A short time ago we built a pirate ship. It took us a while, but it was kind of fun because it was it involved a lot of planning where like, I like to have him think about what are we doing next week, what are we doing the week after. We sort of plan through, we talk about could he become an architect? And he really likes that idea because he likes to build, he likes houses. Um, so I thought, well, I could talk him through that and talk about what the steps would be. I never know if the, some of these things are getting through, but this time I did because he came back to me one day out of the blue and said that he had talked to his mom about possibly becoming an architect someday. And his mom said she would help him be an architect. I knew that some of these things were getting through and he was talking about it with his mom. Another part of my mentoring time with my student that I really like is just chatting. I think during all of our activities, whether we're coloring or we're building a model or we're eating, we're always talking about just things about family. We feel like we know each other. We joke around. He gives me a hard time. I give him a hard time. A big part of volunteering is just showing up. Um, you don't have to be, you don't have to plan for days in advance on what you're going to do here. The thing you're doing isn't as important as the time you're spending. I think the school has, gives us so much support. Um, the teachers do, the staff does, the principal does. It just feels like you're walking into your house. I mean, it's, this place is very warm. The kids are great. It makes you feel happy walking in the door. Everybody that attends community is pre-qualified to do this kind of thing because you understand what it takes to make a difference in the world. I feel like the relationship that we build here between a student and a mentor really has a chance to change a kid's life. Yeah, how about that? I think it's a great example of how we can uh, be the hands and feet and show the love and not just walk you know, with a blind eye uh, but really get to know. And uh, maybe that's something you're interested in being a part of. Hopefully everybody has a card that, that looks something like this. And if this is a, a, of interest to you, and as you heard, Tom, uh, this is going to be during the school year. But this is the month, you know, the summer months where we start to train and prepare and, and sort of line up all of our mentors. And you can be a mentor, you can be a prayer partner, or you can even be a scholarship provider uh, that helps underwrite some of the costs associated with the program. But beautiful opportunity. And I would love for you to consider doing that again uh, this fall when the school year resumes. My wife Amy and I, uh, we have both been Kids Hope mentors for several years in, in the schools in East Joliet. And I remember, this goes back several years, <clears throat> several years ago, but I was paired up with a fourth grader. And at the time, I had a fourth grader. My oldest was a fourth grader. And so I knew educationally where fourth graders ought to be. But the fourth grader that I walked into to mentor couldn't even read. I mean, it was the most painful thing ever. And we've all been there and we've seen kids struggle. You know, it was, it was like, could barely pick out one word in a sentence. And so every week for one hour through the whole school year, we started with one word and then two words and then one sentence and then two sentences and then one paragraph and then two paragraphs. And by the end of the fourth grade, that student that I got to mentor had a voice and he used his voice to, re to read from cover to cover the diary of a wimpy kid at a fourth grade le le reading level. And it was a beautiful thing. And you can have that opportunity just like Tom, just like my wife and I. And so I'd love for you to consider that. It's childish to think that any of us can do it ourselves. It is not true that God helps those who help themselves. But on the contrary, God helps those who cannot, can't, help themselves. And he often uses you and he uses me 
to accomplish that. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. God, I pray that by the whole power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would remove any obstacle or barrier <clears throat> that would get in the way of us helping and loving and coming alongside to judge fairly, Lord. God, whatever prejudices we have, whatever self-conceived, you know, whatever thoughts or, or, or notions we have about why somebody is the way they are, God, I pray that you'd help us to look past that and to see them the way you created them and the hopes and the dreams and the plans that you have for them, God. And may we be obedient to your Holy Spirit and may we come alongside them, Lord, to judge fairly and to love them. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen.